Jesus Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. Good morning. I want to welcome you this morning to Berean Bible Church. We're going to talk this morning about inspiration and the second coming. Have you ever wondered why it is that two men can read the same identical passage of Scripture and come up with two totally different interpretations? I mean, if you read a lot of commentaries, it's funny how people come up with different ideas. Or why two men can read the same Bible. I mean, we've got the same Bible. We can read the, even the same version and, come and see things totally different. Two men who love God and yet the same Scripture is seen in two totally different ways. Two men who love God and yet see it in totally different ways. And you might ask, well, maybe one of them is stubborn and unreasonable. Well, maybe, but that doesn't have to be the truth, okay? Uh, because each of us has within us something called a paradigm. This paradigm tells us what life is to be like, all right? The word paradigm means model or map. And we look at life through our paradigms. Inside each of us is a map, it's a model of what life ought to be like. Our paradigms are representations of life, and we all have them. And we all have paradigms on eschatology. Now, when I talk about eschatology, I'm not talking about the end of time. I'm talking about the time of the end. And there's a big difference between those two ideas. Eschatology is the doctrine of last things or end times. And it has to do with the last things of God's plan of redemption. It's the last things of Old Covenant Israel as we move into the New Covenant. Not the last things of earth. You know, and the thing we have to understand, and I think you realize this, that we all interpret life through our paradigms. We look at life and we compare it to our model. And we decide if it's good, or if it's bad, if it's right, or if it's wrong. We interpret life through the model we have developed within us. Now, most people don't question the models that they have. And that's maybe where I'm a little different, <laughs> because I question everything, alright? But I think most people just assume they have the right model. Like you were just born, and boom, you are handed the right model of everything, and you know everything how it's supposed to be. And our paradigms are developed over a period of time as we go through life. Well, our eschatological paradigms have been developed through our church life and what we have heard. And not only in church, but movies, songs. I mean, people who aren't even believers have an eschatology. And the predominant eschatological paradigm of the church today is the late great planet Earth exploding in a cataclysmic destruction of fire. You know, and you see all these movies. The Earth's going to end. God's going to blow it all up. God's going to start all over. And we have that paradigm. Now, there's a thing called a paradigm shift. Which is when you view things one way, and all of a sudden you get new information, and you shift. And all of a sudden, now you view things in a different way. For example, most people hold to the paradigm that the earth is a spinning ball. <laughs> but those of us who are geocentric have had a paradigm shift and we question things. And see, that's you know, <laughs> the, the, thing about, the thing about the spinning ball, people just don't question it, okay? I don't want to get too in-depth in this, but you have a ball that's covered with water on the backside, underside, you know, water's just hanging all over, and the ball's spinning at a thousand miles an hour, and all that water just sticks to that ball, and here's the thing, scientifically, there has never been an experiment to prove that we're spinning. Scientifically, the opposite is true, okay? Mickelson and Maury, Airy, have done experiments and prove the Earth's not moving. But most people don't care about information, all right? They just have a model, and they're going to hang on to their model, no matter what. 
Let me give you another example. A man was on a subway in Long Island, New York, and he's riding the subway, and this gentleman got on with three kids. And these kids were just out of control. They're young kids, and they're bothering every passenger on the subway. And the longer the guy sat there and watched these kids, the more irritated he got with the man. He was just, you know, you've been there? You see people acting like, this is your paradigm. Children should sit down, behave, be, you know. And so this it was blowing his paradigm, all right? Finally, he couldn't take it any longer. He was so angry with the irresponsibility of the man that he just couldn't stand it. Looks like, Mr. Don't you think you should get a handle on your kids? They're bothering everyone on the subway car. And the man looked up and he said, I'm sorry, you're right. We just came from the hospital where their mother died, and I don't know how to process it, and I guess they don't either. I'm sorry. Well, you know what happened at that moment? That angry man had a paradigm shift. He was viewing life, you know, from the fact that these kids are bothering me, not viewing the fact of what, what's happening here. What is going on with these people? Those man's feelings were pulled kind of inside out, and he had a paradigm shift. Well, paradigm shifts are in Scripture, and they're part of your life and part of my life. Paul had a paradigm shift on the road to Damascus. He's going on this road, persecuting Christians, killing Christians. He thought Yeshua was a heretic. He was trying to stomp it out. And then he had a paradigm shift because he met the Lord. And all of a sudden, things change, and now he wants to preach the very person he's been attacking. That's a paradigm shift. His view totally changed. Well, it was in the beginning of 1997, I had a paradigm shift. My views of the second coming of Christ drastically changed and very quickly changed. I had believed in a future second coming since I became a Christian in 1975. I mean, it's kind of something you just inherit. You become a Christian, the Lord's coming in the future. Everybody knows that, right? I mean, like I said, the songs teach us that, the movies teach us that, everything's to that end. But then in light of some very compelling scriptural evidence, I no longer believe that the second coming was future. Now listen carefully, because this is important. I am not saying I don't believe in the second coming of Christ. Because I've had people accuse me of that. Oh, you don't believe in the second coming. I do believe it. I just believe it's past, not future. There's a huge difference there, alright? To deny the fact of the second coming is to deny the inspiration of Scripture. Would you agree with me on that? I mean, if you say, no, the Bible doesn't teach the second coming, you're denying Scripture because it does teach that. All over the place it teaches that. Okay, so we agree on that? Well, I believe that to deny the time of the second coming is just as clear as the fact of the second coming, and to deny the time statements that the Bible gives of the second coming is also to deny inspiration. So if you're going to say, well, the Bible teaches the second coming, that's right, the Bible's inspired and it teaches that, but the Bible also teaches the time of the second coming just as clearly. But most people don't want to agree with that. So almost every time the Bible talks about the second coming of Christ, it gives us a time statement. Now let me remind you of an educational study that I've shared with you many times. In this educational study they did, people were given a new concept. All right? Such as the earth is stationary. Or... The second coming already happened. New. It was new to them. They never believed that before. And they were asked to believe it. Okay, here's some new information. Here's what we think, you know, and you're given this brand new information. And in order to believe this, it resulted in them setting aside some things they already believed. In other words, you have to have a paradigm shift. You had to change your idea on some things. Well, here's how the study went. 50% of the people believed it immediately. They heard it and they said, that sounds good, and they just jumped on the bandwagon. 30% didn't believe it immediately. Nah, I don't like that. They just totally rejected it. 15% of the people wanted to wait for a while so they could think about it, but they never asked for any more information, never did any research, just, yeah, let me, let me wait a while on that one. You know, that's, I don't know if I want to make a decision. The study said this, 5% of the people analyzed all the details and finally came to a conclusion. 
So the results of the study goes like this. Here's the results. It's estimated that 5% of the people think. 15% of the people think they think. And 80% of the people would rather die than think. Okay? Now, when I hear this study and I hear there's, a, you know, there's 5% of the people who actually think, that reminds me of the Bereans. Because the Bereans, in Acts 17, our church is named after Berean Bible Church, which is a difficult name to have when you're explaining it to non-believers. What's your name of your church? I often get Korean Bibles. No, Berean. I have to spell it every time. Berean. B-E-R-E-A. And Berean Bible Church. And then people say, well, where does that come from? And let me tell you something. If I say Berean Bible Church and somebody looks at me and says, oh, Acts you know, 17, I'm like, wow, you know a little bit about your Bible, you know, because you know about the Bereans. Acts 17, 10 and 11. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews, the Bereans is talking about, they're the Jews are talking about, were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness. Paul's teaching and they're receiving it, but they're not just receiving it. Watch what it says, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So the Bereans were excited to hear what Paul was saying, but they didn't just take it and say, yeah, it's great. Let's believe this. They didn't accept, they didn't reject, they studied they got in there and they examined the Scriptures to see if what Paul was saying is true. You heard me. I've given you before R.B. Theme's interpretation of this verse, right? R.B. Theme, he's called the Colonel. used to teach, you know, a well-known teacher of the past. He said the Bereans were jackasses because you got no right to question the preacher. That tells you a little bit about the control he had over his people, all right? You know, and, that, and that's a dangerous position, people. If you can't be questioned, there's something wrong there. Because they were questioning Paul. Is this true? Let's get in the Bible. Let's find out if what Paul was saying is true. That's what we're to do. And that, I tell you that all the time. Don't believe what I'm telling you. Get in your Bible, take what I've said, and examine it and find out, is that truly what the Bible says about it? Well, people, I'm asking you to be five percenters. I'm begging you all to be five percenters, to be a Berean, to search the Scriptures. Not to pull your friends. That's what a lot of people do. Let me go ask my friend what they think about this. It's called pooling your ignorance. Not to you know, go into church history, see what church has, history has to say, or see what the commentaries have to say, but search the Scriptures. Do the Scriptures line up with this? The cry of the Reformation was sola scriptura. The Scriptures alone. Anything that contradicts the Scripture has to be set aside and the Scriptures must be authoritative. I want to remind you of something you've probably heard me say over and over. All of our theology has to come from exegesis. Exegesis means to draw out of the Scriptures. The Greeks, the idea of drawing out. We as believers have to draw out. That's when you're doing exegesis, you're drawing out what this says. Listen, as believers, we need to hold to a theological paradigm, all right? We need a model or a map to check that you hear things and you run it through your model, your paradigm. You say, well, they're saying this, nah, that doesn't seem to fit with what I know the scriptures to say. So we need a theological paradigm. But when your theological paradigm conflicts with the scripture, what do you do? Well, you either change your paradigm or change the Scripture. And it's kind of foolish to try to change the Scripture so when, you're, when what you believe contradicts the Scripture, change your paradigm. We talked about this last week. The Jehovah Witnesses, what they believe contradicts the Bible, so they changed the Bible. They rewrote it to make it agree with them. It's ridiculous. You need to change your paradigm. And that's why you need to be fluid in your paradigms because the more you learn, the more you're going to change. Now, I know that most people hold to a theological paradigm that the second coming of Christ is future. You can talk to almost any Christian, they're going to tell you that. What I would like you to do today is to examine your paradigm in light of the inspired Word of God. I think I, most people, most Christians are going to believe that the second coming, the Bible teaches it, they believe in the second coming because they believe in inspiration. And the Bible does teach that. 
What I want you to realize is the same Bible that teaches the second coming teaches the time of the second coming. And to deny either of those facts, the time of the second coming is to deny Scripture. Because it's taught just as clearly. So what does the inspired revelation teach us about the time of Christ's return? Well, as we look at these Scriptures, please examine your paradigm and see if it lines up with what the Scripture says. If it doesn't, then have a paradigm shift. Move your paradigm. We're going to start with, this is where it all started for me, is Matthew 16. For the Son of Man is going to come with His angels in glory, in the glory of His Father, and then He's going to repay each person according to what He has done. People, verse 27 clearly speaks of the second coming. we got Christ coming. He's coming with angels. He's coming to reward every man. Just compare that with Revelation. It's so clear. So far, no problem. But then you have a problem with that verse 28 because he says, I say to you, there's some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Who are the you in this verse? I say to you, is He talking to us? He wrote this for us, right? Did He write it for us? You people in 2,000 years in America, you're going to read this verse and I'm, I'm talking. No. He's talking to the people who stand. All you got to do is back up to verse 24. And then we see that He's talking to His disciples. So Yeshua is saying to His disciples who were standing right in front of Him as He was talking that some of them would still be alive when He returned in the second coming. Now some say here He's talking about the transfiguration. The next chapter, verse chapter 17, verse 2, but that's only six days away from this point. So is he saying some of you will still be alive in six days? No, I don't think so. And did he come in the glory of his Father in the transfiguration and reward everyone according to his works? No, he did not. How about Pentecost? No, Pentecost doesn't fit that either. That was only a couple months later. They were all still alive except for Judas. So what are the possible explanations to this verse? I mean, how do we deal with this? You know what most people do when they read this? Keep reading. That's what you do when you don't understand something. Just keep reading. Can't mean what it says, but we'll figure it out later. Let's just keep reading. What if you just stop and, and say, what does he mean here? What are the possible explanations? I see three. Number one, there's still some disciples alive today. Right? Because he said, some of you are still going to be here when I come back. So if the second coming hasn't happened, then we still have some disciples alive. Anybody like that one? Got some 2,000-year-old disciples? I've run into people who believe this. Because they know what the options are, and they said, yeah, I'm going to stick with that one. I'm going to go with view number one. All right? View number two, Yeshua was confused or lying. I mean, he said he was coming back, but eh, maybe he made a mistake. Yeah, anybody got a problem with that? I hope you got a problem with that because that goes against inspiration. That goes against the deity of Christ. It goes against everything we believe. Of course, he can't be confused or lying. Well, let me give you a third one. Hang on to this. Yeshua actually did what he said and came in the lifetime of his disciples. I'd like to convince all of you of this one. This seems like the simple and clear answer that holds the inspiration of Scripture. Yeshua did what he said he was going to do. Now, it, like I said, if you have another explanation, another option, I'd like to know what it is. Because this verse is clearly dealing with the second coming, and he's talking to the people that are there, and he tells them, I'm telling you, the ones who are standing here, you're not going to die before I come back. And I'm comfortable with the view that he returned in the first century. Because let me ask you this, does Scripture contradict Scripture? No, it does not. We've talked about this over and over. The primary rule of hermeneutics, the science of biblical inter interpretation, is called the analogy of faith. And that rule just simply tells us that Scripture interprets Scripture. This means that no part of Scripture can be interpreted in such a way as to render it in conflict with what is clearly taught elsewhere in Scripture. Another principle of hermeneutics is that the implicit, that which is suggested though not plainly expressed, is to be interpreted by the explicit. That which is clearly stated. I don't know how you see it, but to me, Matthew 16, 27, 28 seems to be explicit. It's pretty clear. Now, <clears throat> now if you're going to believe what Yeshua is saying here, you're going to have to have a paradigm shift 
on the time of the second coming. Now, the idea might be new to you, but it wasn't new to the disciples because Yeshua had told them already He was going to return in their lifetime. If we back up to Matthew chapter 10, verse 23, Yeshua's talking. He tells His disciples, when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. Or you're, the disciples are going to be persecuted after His death. When they persecute, go to the next town. Now watch. Truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. So, the liberal scholar, the unbeliever, they got a simple solution. Yeshua was wrong about the time of His return. He, he just was confused. No, we can't accept that. Those who take the Bible seriously must look at Yeshua's words here. The cities He referred to are buried now under centuries of dirt. So we got to conclude that sometime in the first century this prophecy was fulfilled. Yeshua has come. He told them He would return in that generation. Let's go to Matthew 24. This is Matthew 24, verse 29 through 34. And we just get the setting. It's clearly second coming here. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give her light. The stars will fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. You know, here's our problem, people. We read these verses and we take them physically and we say, oh my word, everything's falling apart. All you need to do is go back and read Isaiah. Isaiah uses this language over and over of the fall of Babylon, of the fall of different cities. This is language used of the collapse of a nation. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And He will send out His angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender, and puts out its leaves, you know that summer's near. So also, when you see these things, the things He's just been talking about, you know that it's near at the gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now in verse 3 of Matthew 24, Yeshua's disciples asked Him a question. His answer to the question is directed to the disciples. The you in this text is the disciples of the first century. It's not you in the 21st century. Look at verse 33. It, 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 to nail this down, Yeshua set a time limit on the fulfillment of this prophecy. He said, this generation, the one I'm speaking to, the you people I'm talking to. Now, He used the near demonstrative, this, not the far demonstrative, that. He could have said that generation. What one? I don't know. That's sometime in the future. No, this one, the one I'm talking to. As we read the Bible, we need to keep in mind the hermeneutical principle of audience relevance, which seeks to discover what the original audience understood a passage to mean. He's talking to them, and he says, this generation. The concern of the evangelical interpreter is to understand the grammar of a passage in light of the historical circumstances and the context of the original audience. Yeshua said, truly I say to you, the people he's talking to, this generation, your generation, a generation biblically is 40 years. This generation won't pass away until all these things be fil fulfilled. And it's within the generation, Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, which was the coming of the Lord. He was telling them all these things are going to happen in your lifetime, people. The Bible's not written in 2018. We need to always remember that the first century Christians were the first believers to read these words. And we need to seek to put ourselves in their shoes which means we understand Old Covenant language before we try to interpret New Covenant language. What do these words mean to them? The Bible's written for us, but it's not written to us. And it's not until we understand what it meant to them that we can apply the principles to ourselves. Well, the Lord goes on and says that at His second coming, He's going to crush Satan. In Romans 16.20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet the grace of our Lord Yeshua the Christ be with you. Now, the word crush here, uh, King James uses the word bruise, which is not a good word. The word is soon trebo, it means to crush completely, to shatter, to break in pieces. When is it that Satan's to be crushed completely? Soon. 
He said, it's going to happen soon. Remember the audience. First century. Do you think that the believers of Rome could have conceived of 2,000 plus years being shortly? He's coming shortly and they're thinking, oh good, in just a couple thousand years this will happen. How could he crush them under their feet because they wouldn't even be around. They'd be gone. They'd be dust by this time. And let, let me just say a word about the crushing of Satan here. I believe that Satan was a real divine being. But I believe he was destroyed in AD 70. I believe this because, again, I believe in inspiration. The Bible over and over talks about the destruction of the devil. That was one of the reasons Christ came. Hebrews 2.14 Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Christ, likewise partook of the same things. He became human. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. See, one of the aspects of Christ's earthly ministry was to destroy the devil. The Greek word destroy here, katargeo, to render idle, to abolish, to destroy. And I have to ask people, do you think Christ was a failure in His mission? Because most Christians act like He was. They're all worried about the devil. I think we want the devil to be around so we have somebody to blame for our sin. And I, and I had a conversation with a lady. This wouldn't have been in the first message because this was happened later, okay, but... I had a conversation, we were talking about the second coming, and I was sharing my view with her and her husband, and they were sitting there listening, and I could see the gears turning in her head, and so after I got done with my presentation, she said, what's that mean about Satan? I said, it means he's done, he's crushed, he's destroyed, and she was like, I'm like, what's the problem? You need the devil or something? She goes, well, I don't know, and you could tell she was very, very troubled. Well, she came to me about a month later, and she goes, you know something? My life has drastically changed since we talked. I'm like, how so? She goes, when I realized that the devil was gone, I had no one to blame for my sin, and I had to deal with it personally. She goes, I just blamed a lot of stuff on him and just said, if he's doing it, I have no part of it, and I just ignored it. She goes, now I've changed some things. See, theology matters, people. Theology matters. You know, many Christians have that Flip Wilson mentality, the devil made me do it. No, he did not. Okay? He did not. Look at 1 John 3 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Again, destroy, luo, to loosen, to break up, to destroy. Do you believe the Bible, or does your theology come from empiricism? See, most people feel some certain way, and so on. I feel this, so I think it's true. Well, it doesn't matter what you feel. What does the Bible teach about things? Colossians 2.15 He disarmed, this is Christ, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to an open shame by triumphing over them in Him. According to my Bible, Satan is the defeated foe. Satan is the ruler and authority that he's talking about here. They're, put, they're done. They're destroyed. Now, people say, well, well, if Satan's destroyed, why is there so much sin in the world? Why is there so much temptation? You know where James tells us sin comes from? Every man is tempted, he says, when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Man is depraved, and we battle the flesh. We battle evil men. We battle corrupt paradigms. We battle the effects of sin. But Yeshua has conquered the devil. Satan is not the God of this world any longer. The Lord, Yeshua the Christ is. He has been defeated. He was the God of the old covenant system. He, I believe He was the God over Rome and He is destroyed. Now let's look at some other passages that give us an idea of Christ soon coming in the first century. Remember that to deny the fact of the time of the coming of the Lord is to deny the inspiration of Scripture. 1 Corinthians, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of the Lord Yeshua the Christ. Let's talk about the second coming. The, the Corinthians were waiting for the Lord to come. Why? Because they believed He would come in their lifetime. Look at 729. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. It's quick. It's going to happen soon. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they have none. The time is coming. The day of the Lord is soon to happen. 
7.31, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of the world, it's passing away. It's present tense. This world is passing away. He's talking about the old covenant world. 10.11, now these things happened to them as examples, and they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Paul's saying these first century Corinthians, the end of the ages is coming upon them. 2,000 years ago. That age was the age in which Satan was the god of this world. That ended in AD 70. Philippians 1.6 And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion when? At the day of Yeshua the Christ. At the second coming. The Lord's going to bring to completion what He's doing in your life. He, says, he doesn't say He's going to perform it when you die. But when Christ comes, Look at 1 Thessalonians 3.13. So that He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord. So the first Thessalonians, the first century Thessalonians, they were going to be brought to completion at the coming of the Lord. Something they waited for. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. May the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Yeshua. Now, if the Lord has still not come, how could their body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord? Let me remind you again of audience relevance as we read these next verses. First, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6-8 Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Alright, understand what's going on. They're being persecuted. They're being afflicted. All right? Afflict to, uh, let me back up. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, so God's going to take care of those who are afflicting you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted. God's going to give you relief as well as us. When, when are they going to get relief? When are they going to get a break from the suffering? He says, when the Lord Yeshua is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God. How could this be any comfort to them if the Lord has not returned yet? If it was thousands of years later, how does this comfort the first century Thessalonians that were suffering? How can this do anything but give them false hope? Inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the Gospel. The Lord's going to come and deal with those people who are troubling you. 1 Timothy 6.14 And keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of the Lord Yeshua Christ. So he's, Timothy's telling him, listen you guys, keep, keep living holy until the Lord returns here. It's going to happen soon. Keep it up. Hebrews 10.36-37 and 37, For you have need of endurance. So that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what was promised. Now watch what he says. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. They were suffering. They needed to endure until he came to deliver them in a very little while. Look at James 5, 7-9. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. So James is writing to first century believers, and he says, you guys just be patient until the Lord comes. Just a couple thousand years. Be patient. That's ridiculous, people. No one has that kind of patience, right? He says, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and latter rain. You also, be patient. Establish your hearts. Watch for the coming of the Lord is at hand. You be patient. Because you don't have to be patient long because the coming of the Lord is at hand. It's coming quickly. Don't grovel against one another, brothers. So you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. He's about to come. Again, here we have Christians who are suffering under the persecution of the Jews and they're told to be patient until the Lord comes because it's going to come soon, not thousands of years later. I can't see how that would be much comfort to them if the Lord wasn't coming soon. Let's put yourself in this situation. Let's say you're suffering. Let's say you're being persecuted for your faith. And because of your faith, you lost your job. And you've been branded as a Christian. And now you can't get another job. 
And your landlord's about to evict you because you can't pay the rent. And guess what? You don't have any food to feed your family because you don't have a job, and so your family is hungry. And you guys are in real trouble. You have no food. Soon you're going to be out in the street. you got no place to live. you got a family to take care of. Well, you get a letter from your rich uncle who said, hang on, brother, because I'm going to be there soon. Now, he said soon, but he does, he's not really going to come for a couple thousand years. What do you care if he comes in a couple thousand years? You'll be long gone by that time. If what the Lord is promising didn't come in their lifetime, then it was a false hope. He said soon, and he meant soon. He was coming to relieve them, to deal with the affliction. Look at 1 John 2.18, children, it's the last hour. Oh, we're getting close now, people. As you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists are come. Therefore, we know it's the last hour. It wasn't going to be long. The time was short. Now we're getting near the end, and it's the last hour. Let's go to the last book of the Bible, all right? Boy, people love the book of Revelation and all the, you know, apocalyptic, apocalyptic imagery of it. But I want you to notice the time statements. This book is bracketed by time statements. The revelation of Yeshua the Christ which God gave him to show his servants. All right, God's writing to those people to show the servants the thing which must soon take place. This book says it's written to the seven churches in Asia Minor, and he even lists the churches. That's who he's writing to. And he's writing to tell them the things that will soon take place. And how can you say the book of Revelation is not fulfilled yet? You're calling God a liar because he said it's going to soon take place. Let's drop down to verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads... This prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written, because the time is near. The time for these prophecies, he says, is near. So that's how the book starts. It's going to happen. I'm writing to the servants to tell them what's happening soon. The time is near. Then you go through all the great stuff that's in this book, and you get to the very last chapter. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. That's what he said at the beginning. He's going to show them what soon happened. Now watch, and behold, I am coming soon. Again, this is written to the seven churches in Asia Minor that lived in the first century. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now he goes on to say this, and he said to me, do not seal up the words of this prophecy. If you remember, he told Daniel to seal the words up. Now he's telling him, don't seal the words, why? Because the time is near. It wasn't near in Daniel. We'll look at that in a minute. Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I'm coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. That sounds like Matthew 16, 28. 22, 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Yeshua. How can you say these things have not happened yet when the Lord says very clearly, this is happening soon, quickly, to those people who He wrote? Look at verse 1, soon take place. Verse 3, the time is near. Then you get to 22, 6, it's soon to take place. I'm coming soon. 22, 10, the time is near. 22, 12, I'm coming soon. 22, 20, I'm coming soon. Do you think the Lord could have stressed it anymore? Now keep in mind audience relevance, which seeks to understand what the original audience understood this passage to mean. He said he was coming soon. It was imminent. You can't read the New Testament without seeing the soon coming expectation of the Christ. And people, the same event cannot be imminent at two different periods separated by thousands of years. If it was soon to them, it's not soon to us. It can't be soon to us. Now someone's going to say, because someone always says, but the day of the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day, right? God doesn't know time, the time doesn't matter, so God said soon, but He just met, met a thousand, couple thousand years. Does that really make sense to people? You're saying that God doesn't know anything about time? Yes, God is beyond time. Time doesn't matter to Him. But God is writing to who? To us. And time does matter to us. And so, if you're saying these Time statements make no sense at all then. He said soon, but he meant a couple thousand years. Then why would he say soon? Because soon has meaning. 
Yes, 2 Peter 3.8 does say, one day as the Lord is as a thousand years. In the context, God is simply saying that God keeps His promises. He's not bound by time. But here's what you've got to understand. We are bound by time. And God speaks to us in a language we can understand. And though God is not bound by time, God can tell time. Do you know that? Don Preston, in his little track, God Can Tell Time, gives this following argument. Here we have Balaam the prophet making a prediction of Christ's coming. He says, I see Him, but not now. I behold Him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall arise out of Israel. He's talking about Christ here. All right? And he says His coming is not now. He says it's not near. The coming of Christ was not at hand. It was over 1,400 years away when Balaam made this prediction. That's a, 1,400 years is a long time, people. But if 1,400 years is a long time, how can 2,000 be soon? Now, in Daniel chapters 10 through 12, we have a vision encompassing a, time, a period of time from 536 B.C. to the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, which is about 600 years. And Daniel is told, it came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. So Daniel gets this vision. It's relayed to Daniel from God. And while God is not bound by time, he's communicating to a man who is bound by time. And God here calls 600 years a long time. He says this 600 years involved many days. Now, Daniel contains another important example of how God used time words. In chapter 8, it contains a prophecy that extends from 530 B.C. to 165 B.C. in the death of Antiochus Epiphanes. The time covered is about 365 years. How did God express the prophecy? Did He say it was at hand? Did He say some of it was at hand and while some of it would happen later? No, God viewed the prophecy as a whole and He said, the vision of the evening and the morning that has been told you is true, but seal up the vision. Remember, we just read in Revelation, he, they're not to seal it up, but Daniel's told to seal it up. Why? Because it refers to many days from now. So here's a prophecy that covers 365 years, and God says, seal it up because it's a long ways away. If God called 365 days a long time, how can man say that 2,000 years is speaking of soon? Or that God doesn't understand time? Now, this is an important question in light of the traditional interpretations of Revelation. Daniel was told to seal up the vision because it's a long time away, 365 years. John was specifically told not to seal up the vision because the time is at hand. John's vision is coming soon. It's at hand. It's shortly. Daniel's 365 years is a long time away. See, most commentators approach Revelation as future, just ignoring what God said in it about the time. And many don't realize that the Bible gives an example, actually, of a man, a man attempting to change the meaning of time and change the meaning of God's words. In Ezekiel 7, God through Ezekiel said the day of the Lord was at hand. All right, it's coming quickly. The day of the Lord, in this context, is when God was going to judge Babylon, or He's going to use Babylon to punish Israel for their sin. The day of the Lord, it's coming soon. Well, those people said, no, it's not. We don't believe that. It's not coming soon. God doesn't know how to tell time. This concept of the day of the Lord, it's not an end of the time idea, but God is punishing a nation, so it's the end for them. Now, in chapter 11, Israel responded to the threat of the coming judgment. They insisted, though, although Ezekiel said it was at hand, it really wasn't. They said, no, God didn't mean that. They said, it's time to build houses. Don't worry about judgment. You can almost hear some of them say, well, yeah, Ezekiel, but the day of the Lord is at hand, but one day is the Lord like a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. See, when Israel turned God's words of eminence into meaningless words, God responded. This is Ezekiel chapter 12, 21 through 28. And the word of Yahweh came to me, son of man, what is this proverb that you have about the land of Israel saying, the days grow long, every vision comes to nothing. In other words, God's saying we're going to be judged, but don't worry about it. 
Tell them therefore, thus says the Lord Yahweh, I will put an end to this proverb and they shall no more use it, a proverb in Israel. But say to them, the days are near in the fulfillment of every vision. For there shall be no more false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am Yahweh. I speak the word that I will speak and it will be performed. I will no longer be delayed. So they kept saying, don't worry, God's not going to do anything. But in your days, O rebellious house, I will speak the word and perform it, declares the Lord Yahweh. And the word of Yahweh came to me, Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say, the vision that he sees is for many days. They say, it's a long way off, don't worry about it. From now, they're just saying it's just a long time off. And he prophesies a time far off, so they're saying, eh, it's some, some distant. Same thing people today say about Revelation. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord Yahweh, none of my words will be delayed any longer. But the word that I speak will be performed, declares the Lord Yahweh. So Yahweh told Ezekiel, tell Israel that her days of changing the time for predictions are over. It's a judgment is at hand. They said it wasn't. So what we have then is an example of man saying that while God said something was imminent, it really wasn't. It was a long time off. And we have God's response when God said at hand, He meant at hand. He didn't mean hundreds of thousands of years. He meant soon. So as God changes vocabulary, is it true that at hand once did mean in hand, but now it means however long you want to stretch it out? Where's the evidence of that change? Surely the honest student can clearly see that there's no such change in God's vocabulary. God can tell time, people. He can read a calendar. And when God says something is at hand, when He says it's near, that's what He means. For man to argue otherwise is to reject the inspiration of Scripture. It's to impugn the faithfulness of God. It's to impugn God's ability to communicate with us. It's to do the very thing that Israel of old did and for which they were condemned. This is a serious thing, people. Now I'm sure that you've got to be thinking, well, if the Lord did come back in AD 70, how do we miss it? all these years? How's the church missed it all these years? How could He have come back and we not known? Well, the problem here is one of preconceived ideas. It's because of the paradigms that we have developed. We think the second coming is an earth-burning, heaven-melting, geography-changing event, and so we assume there's no way it could happen because our paradigm won't let us see it because we think it's something different than it is. And I submit to you that Either Scripture is wrong about the time of the second coming and thus not inerrant. You see that, right? If the Scripture is wrong, then it can't be inerrant. Or, let me give you another option, because we don't like that option, right? Our paradigms are wrong about the nature of the second coming. Which one of those are you more comfortable with? An incorrect paradigm or an uninspired Scripture? There's a big difference there, people. And the Scripture is very clear about the timing. Now, obviously, from a physical perspective, this hasn't happened. And that's people's big deal. Well, physically, you know, the stars are still up there. Well, listen, you got to understand language. He was never talking about stars physically falling out of the sky. That's not what that language meant. You know, and so we hold to a physical paradigm. And as long as we do, we say this can't be true. It can't have happened. Well, look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2. This is a really important verse. Now, concerning the coming of our Lord. Okay, he starts out, you get what he's talking about. He's talking about the coming of Christ. Concerning the coming of the Lord. All right? And our being gathered to Him. So the, the subject is coming. The coming of Christ. We ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarm, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter, Seeming to be from us. So people were writing letters. They were hearing that the second coming had already happened. That's what he says. To the effect that the day of the Lord has come. See, the Thessalonians were upset because someone was teaching that the Lord had already come. And they said, well, how can that be? So they're, they're upset about it. Now let me ask you this. How is it that the Thessalonians thought the second coming already happened? 
if they viewed the nature of these things physically, how could they have thought it already happened? But that's clearly what the text says. They thought it already happened. And Paul's writing to comfort them. If their concept of the second coming was an earth-burning, heaven-melting, geography-changing event, how'd they think it happened? If Paul's teaching a coming, the second coming is an earth-burning, heaven-melting, geography-changing event, all Paul had to do was say to the Thessalonians, hey guys, look out the window. You see out there, there's still grass, it's green, the sky is blue, everything. Oh, obviously the Lord didn't come. But Paul didn't say any of that stuff to them. Paul never corrects their idea of the nature of second coming. Paul doesn't write and say, guys, when it happens, you'll know it because, man, the earth is going to burn up. No, he doesn't, he doesn't correct their nature of the coming. They must have viewed the nature of the second coming differently than we do. They didn't view it as a physical event. Now remember our hermeneutical principle. The implicit is to be interpreted by the explicit. The time statements are explicit. And we need to interpret what we don't understand in light of what we do. And to me, that's the simplest thing about preterism. Just look at the time that he said this was going to happen. And if you believe the Bible, if you believe in inspiration, then it's really clear. The Lord said He was going to return quickly. He said soon, shortly. Some of you standing here will not taste death. To this generation, He used every possible time indicator that He could. Why don't we believe Him? We could believe Him if we had a paradigm shift and our understanding of the nature of the second coming we didn't view it as a physical event, but a spiritual event that was the changing of the covenant. At AD 70, God put an end to Old Covenant Israel and consummated the New Covenant, the church. The covenants changed. The mark of that event was AD 70 with the destruction because the Lord said not one stone's going to be left here upon another, and He destroyed that building. Listen, that was the end of Old Covenant Israel. They've never sacrificed since. Judaism has totally evolved and changed since then because they can't offer sacrifices. Their temple is gone. The priesthood is gone because we are in the new covenant. It is a spiritual event, people. Just like the new birth is spiritual, the new covenant is a spiritual event where we live in the fullness of the presence of God. We don't, we're not separated from God by that temple anymore. God is not behind a veil that we can't get to. He dwells with us now. That's the blessing of the new covenant. He says, I will dwell with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Lord, it just seems so blatantly clear to me through the time statements that you did just what you said you'd do and you returned quickly, shortly, in that generation to those who are still alive at that time. Father, I pray that now you would give us the heart of Bereans, Lord. We would not accept, we would not reject. We'd dig, we'd study, we'd examine the Scriptures to see if these things are so. And if they are, then we'd have a paradigm shift, Lord. Father, to me, the whole issue here is inspiration and your trustworthiness. You said you were going to do something, you did it. We don't have to question you. We just trust you. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Amen. Thank you.